afferent cells like glucostatic sensitive cells, but from the peripheral tissues should be directed to the uh, central nervous system, specifically ventromedial nucleus and lateral areas of the hypothalamus, which has been described as a satiety center and hunger center. At this size, the signals are inter interpreted at the brain and the, and the brain makes the decision to eat or stop eating. In addition, it can change the me metabolic activity to favor the consumption or storage of lipids and regulate the metabolism of glucose and proteins. Uh, I think we have uh, something in the chat. Oh no, sorry. This is just the link to your assistance. Well, within these centers, within these centers, the signals are interpreted by two groups of neurons, orexigenic neurons and anorectic neurons. These in turn send information to the effector neurons through the activation or inhibition of the MRC3 and MRC4 receptors. And these neurons will be responsible for modify uh, the, metabolism, the metabolic response according to the needs. Normally, these processes are in balance and depending on the demand or for nutrients or other needs, the balance can be lost and lead either the processes of hunger or the processes of satiety. So it's just like uh, this uh, balance that uh, it's important to understand that the peripheral signals may vary due to environmental situations or the physical constitution of the person. For example, the signals from the adipose tissue vary depending on whether the tissue is white or brown. As well as we all know, uh, the distribution of adipose tissue for of the android type favors, uh, sorry, uh, of the adipose tissue of uh, android type favors the presence of brown type adipose cells while the peer distribution favors the presence of white type adipocy adipocytes. Because the production of cytokines and hormones is so different in each tissue, um, the signals sent to the central nervous systems will be different. So clinical management will be also different. As you can understand, <clears throat> the correct uh, functioning of metabolism requires that this balance is not lost. So when a gene mutates and a protein that this gene encodes change, it can generate diseases or predis predisposition to diseases, depending on his penetrance in a certain metabolic event. As for example, leptin, that is a gene with high penetrance in terms of obesity, and insulin is a gene with a lower penetrance in terms of obesity. But in terms of diabetes, insulin has greater penetrance than leptin. This is due to their direct or indirect participation in the molecular pathways. <clears throat> I, I need some for my through. So mutations can be caused by a wide variety of events, some of them very frequent and all much. In every day, we suffer mutations, only that our repair systems keep the damage at bay. If you want to know more about mutations and polymorphism, I'm sharing a recorded class uh, from the chat. Uh, so you can just click uh, at the link later and check it. Um, uh, 
well. I don't have the two of that right now, but I'll share with you in a few moments. Well, even with this, oh, here's the chat. Don't worry. I think it's, she's asking about the link of the Google Forms. Ah, the Google Forms. Well, I am sharing the the class of mutations. So even with this, uh, so far, uh, is had not has not been shown that there there is a disposition to obesity greater than thirty percent. This means that 70% can be attributed to external factors called environmental factors. So which kind of these mental factors are? Well, it's a proportion. One of the factors is the diet. Things that you eat or stop eating can change the way your metabolism works. On the hand, uh, circadian cycles, sleeping a lot or sleeping little, change the expression levels of proteins such as cortisol, which in turn regulate hunger and satiety process. Physical activity, energy consumption, and amount of stored fat are directly related to the amount of daily exercise. And pollution, some contain contaminants in water, uh, air or food can induce the malfunction of human enzymes, changing the individual methods. So these, these are just a few examples of these environmental factors. Uh, these factors can induce uh, this uh, logic or, or have these logical effects, but these factors also can induce the change in the expression of genes, disease, and an example of epigenetics. So I will explain a little bit uh, more about the epigenetics. <clears throat> First of all, humans are uh, deployed beings, have this. I'm sorry, it's just, I think, uh, I think something is wrong with the, with the net because uh, we cannot hear you really well. Okay. So you can, if you can repeat the last part, this one, this one from the beginning, it would be nice. Thank you. Okay, this one. Yeah, this one. Uh -huh. Okay. So I, I was talking about some examples of environmental factors. Environmental factors include these uh, diet, circadian cycles, and physical activity and pollution. Uh, it has uh, logical effects that things that you eat or stop eating can change the way the way uh, that your metabolism works. Circadian cycles, uh, when you sleep, you sleep a lot or sleep little, uh, change the expression levels of proteins such as cortisol, which in turn regulate hunger and satiety process. The energy for fat are directly related to the amount of daily exercise. And pollution, some of contaminants in water, uh, air, or food can induce the malfunction of human enzymes. Change the, the this is just the logical effects, but these factors can induce also the change in the expression of certain genes. This is an example of epigenetics. And we will uh, uh, well, it's well known that humans are deployed beings. Half of our chromosomes come from the ovum and half from the sperm. So it's logical to think that we are just like the information our parents inherited from us. But this is not entirely true, since the expression of certain genes can vary depending on the environmental factors. 
And these causes change in our phenotype. To understand this, uh, let's take the example of homozygous twins. This type of twins share the same genetic information and their phenotype is identical at birth. Uh, as you can see in the slide, these are two twins with the same information. So, to begin with, it's necessary to differentiate what is the phenotype and what is the genotype. The genotype is how the information is encoded in my DNA. While the phenotype is the reflection of that information, that is what I look like. As an example, or a simple example is, my dad is XY genotype and my mom is XX genotype. So if I receive an X from my mom and Y from my dad, my phenotype, as you can see, is XY, and it makes uh, my phenotype male. So this is similar to other genotypes like the hair color or the skin color. Uh, it's just, uh, the same segregating system uh, is Mendelian, Mendelian genetics, recessive and dominant. So most of, uh, most of us contemplate that uh, this can transpolate to diseases, no? Like uh, hemophilia or and others. Um, but what about this uh, phrase? We are, we, are, we are what we eat. Well, <clears throat> Most of us contemplate that the, this phrase is true. And this is because we all understand that the phenotype is the result of the combination of genotype and environment. So it's not just the genotype, the thing that are making look how I look. So environment is very important in this. Well, phenotype is equal to genotype plus environment. Let's take an example. These are Juanito and Carlitos. So Juanito and Carlitos uh, are this kind of twins that are almost uh, identically. But you can see that the phenotype of both are different. This is because uh, the environment are playing something in the day. Say, we are identical twins and our genotype is the same, but our phenotype is not longer the same. So why? Well, partly is because Juanito is an active person. He likes to play. He likes to go going out. He likes to dance. He think in healthy, uh, in healthy things. But Carlitos is a sedentary person. He likes to play Xbox, PlayStation, and stay at home. But being at home, he spends his time eating all the time. Uh, he's going to the refrigerator or the cupboard to snack something. And so the result is obvious, no? Uh, this is a bore, uh, uh, archaic uh, example of epigenetics, uh, environment taking his, uh, his changes. So this is another examples of epigenetics. Uh, some are not so big because you can see here uh, <clears throat> minimal and almost undetectable differences. Some of them are almost identically. Yeah. All are twins, homozygotes. When they are like this, uh, 
more uh, when they are younger it's very difficult to to know who are one and who are the other when but when they are old you can see more differences this is because uh, environment are playing a big role on the developing of, of some characteristics like this. This is uh, an example of uh, work. Uh, they are the they both are twins, but one of them smoke uh, almost all his life. So you can see which of one, which of this uh, smoke, and the other no. Uh, this is the same. One of them smokes, and the other no. So. Well, this is just uh, some examples, no? But we have more interesting examples than these ones. As an example, <clears throat> the adaptation during the embryonic development. So this make me uh, change the phrase for we are what we eat, we are what our mother ate, and we are what our grandmother ate. Epigenetics is not an exclusive phenomen, phenomenon uh, of our adult life. Even during our embryonic development, uh, there are epigenetics change that will mark us for life with one big difference. Most of these epigenetic phenomena are irreversible, whereas changes in adult life that can be. This makes me change the phrase. One big, one big example is during the Second World War, uh, Netherlands, Holland, remained under siege, causing no commercial exchange, and with, a, with it a serve famine. This famine affect adults and children, however, at the same time affect pregnant women. Due to the low calorie intake, many of them lost their pregnancies. While well, those children uh, who, uh, well, while well, those children who were born began to develop health problems during their adolescence and adulthood. So this is because uh, these uh, embryonic adaptations change all the parameters of his uh, metabolic pathways. The Dr. Tessa Jade Rosboom have a lot of uh, works about it. Uh, so if you want to read something about it, uh, please search uh, for his name in PubMed or uh, some databases. And well, curiously, these problems were related to an excess of energy deposits like fat, including uh, cardiac problems, cardiac diseases, hypercholesterolemia, stress, bipolarity, little social flexibility, and general worse uh, health. This is known as 50 phenotype. Three, three, pardon, sorry, <laughs> 50 phenotype uh, is a disease uh, that occurs because mothers consume a very low amount of calories. It's not exclusive for the war. Uh, there is a lot of people right now that can uh, take the, a good amount of calories or good uh, food for optimum development of embryos. So, both well, this embryo adapt to more uh, energy efficient 
since in theory, if the mother does not consume food, it is due to the fact that there are shortage of them. Yeah, there is not a good environmental to, to take care of the kid. So um, the, this gives the future baby a better chance of surviving when they have the thrifty phenotype. However, when it is born and the available, uh, available, uh, available sorry, <laughs> Uh, and the food is uh, good or it, in good amounts, it should consume fewer calories uh, than a normal people, or else the slurps will be stored as a fat. Change is directly associated uh, with this epigenetic change. And is, uh, I, I need to make in hincapié that this phenomenon is not reversible because the epigenetic chain is directly associated with your DNA. There is a type of irreversibly epigenetic control, which consists on methylations in the cytosines uh, of certain genes. Once methylated, they cannot be demethylated normally. This methylation generate uh, gene silicing, uh, causing the protein they encode to not be produced or decrease its production significantly. It's like an interrupter, you know, uh, on and off. When they are methylated, it's off. When they are not methylated, it's on. And it works. Uh, Metabolism can change these adaptations, but they are irreversible. We have another kind of epigenetic controls that are reversible. One of these occurs uh, through the activation of transcriptional factors. Some drugs, even food molecules, can activate these factors. As an example, we have quercetin. When we consume quercetin, it can, it can cross the cell membrane and break the union of NRF2 and KIP1. KIP1 works as an inhibitor of NRF2. So when the union is broken, NRF2 release and translocate to the nucleus where the function, where like a transcriptional factor by directly binding to the antioxidant response element, A-R-E. When they join, well, uh, my slide, the NRF2 is uh, union, uh, making union in the promoter, but they un make the union in the uh, antioxidant response element. When they uh, make this uh, binding, they activate the promoter and increase the action of the promoter, increasing the expression of some antioxidant genes like superoxid dismutase, catalase, uh, glutathione peroxidase, and emoxygenase. This is an example of epigenetic control, uh, more known as a, an, an example of nutrigenomics. Another reversible example of epigenetics control is that one that is mediated by histones. So there are substances, there are substances that can induce the activity of enzymes such as acetylase, methylases, deacetylases, and histones de demethylases, which causes chemical and structural change in, in histones, methylations and deacetylations cause gene expression, while acetylation and demethylations cause gene expression. An example is sulforaphan, uh, which uh, when we consume, it causes an activation of histone deacetylase producing a genetic repression, which caused 
an arrest of the cell cycle that is used as a treatment in cancer patients. Well, no, not like um, the main treatment. Uh, some of the protocols uh, take this like a helper. And um, I think uh, the word superman in the slide is uh, miss. <laughs> I have a mistake when I wrote. So, well, my last example is the methylation of the X chromosome. A woman have a two X chromosome. And the double load of the chromosome is unnecessary, since one copy is enough for a human being to be functional. So the extra copy in woman is commonly found methylated, keeping it repressed and easily visible. And you see through a microscope. This structure uh, no, is known as a bar corpuscle. In the images, we can see this uh, corpuscle. So it's not uh, so tiny that you can see in a good microscope. You can see like this uh, thing. If we change the colors of the slide, which we can see with more definition. So, but is this a structure? Well, from my part, uh, it would be everything. If you have any question, oh, sorry. If you have any question or comments, I would be happy to answer it. If you don't have it, uh, I'm at your service uh, to the mail that we see on the screen. And thanks. I, I have a question. I do. I do have a question. Um, you have you have you have educated us about uh, that if the mother um, is having like a malnourishing, um, mm -hmm. then what? Well, she's pregnant. She's going to have a baby. Uh, with uh, with a genetic malfunction, but um, if in the past, like the woman deployed some kind of a sickness because of that malnourishing, probably an iron deficiency or something like that, um, would that be uh, involved into the genetic uh, development of, of the baby? Okay, first of all, uh, the change of the genes on the baby are not uh, like mutations, you know, it's more like this epigenetic control. Uh, so the genes keep, keep it uh, well, the sequence is the same, it's just the quantity that you can express, overexpress or uh, downexpress. So this is uh, the, the first uh, idea. The other, the other idea that you said uh, is that when they have malnourished uh, before they are pregnant, well, it it have uh, it produced change on the metabolic systems in the, in the woman, but it don't affect the next uh, pregnancies. So. When you have an embryo or you have a fetus, if you are in the in the last uh, three months of the pregnancy, there is the point that you can induce more genetic uh, or epigenetic changes. So in the first and second trimester, uh, it has not uh, the enough power to change the epigenetic uh, adaptation on the fetus. And of course, if you are not pregnant, the changes on your metabolism can't uh, make anything in the fetus adaptation, in the next fetus adaptations. So that's the idea. I don't know if, if it's clear for you. Mm, great, great. Yes, I understood. I think that I understood that 
mm, probably that it would be only a problem and if it is during uh, the, the pregnancy and it is like more uh, like it's more probable if it is after the sixth uh, trimester of the pregnancy is that right yeah the last uh, trimester is uh, the most important part of the pregnancy according to this idea yeah great thank you very much i think that it was very interesting thank you thank you for this for this for this talk sir no you're welcome uh there is another question um let me know um thank you so much for asking uh, in the chat there's a lot of congratulations for your presentation thank you so much danny I don't know if anyone can make a question. You can do it. You can write it down or you can open your microphone. Thank Oscar for doing the question. And while we expect for someone to ask for something, I would like to ask you, Danny, if um, I don't know if you can tell us a little bit more about methylation, the impact that it has in the development of diseases. OK. Uh... So methylation occurs for various uh, environment, environmental factors. It's um, a processes that can. It's a, a group of processes that can be activated to make you or to make more ad adapt. I, I don't how, I don't know how to explain. It's not necessarily bad. Sometimes it's necessary to adapt to the environment. Uh, like this uh, example, it's bad when you are adapt to be more efficient because you, your normal function is with less calories. So your basal consumption of calories is less. But when you arrive the world and you are a baby and the war is over and all the countries that are friends of your country give you food and you have a good uh, develop all of this food uh, bad for you because you eat a lot so uh, it's not necessary bad but when you have this kind of adaptation in a, in a different uh, reality of your environment could be bad uh, another uh, example of uh, this kind of methylations is when you have methylation of some hormones uh, because uh, there was some ch uh, hormone change in your mother. And when you are developing as a kid, uh, maybe you can't uh, have this, uh, uh, this, uh, secondary sexual markers like uh, you know you know develop of uh, the breast or something like that uh, so I, I can remember another that could be good for you in in in, in this moment but these uh, methylations can occur as an adaptation uh, the processes is the same there is and some enzymes that methylate directly the cytosines of the DNA. But there is not an uh, enzyme that can demethylate selectively these points. For that reason, it's irreversible. Uh, it's not the same like when you methylate the whole X chromosome. This is a different methylation process that makes just the DNA like uh, more compact. This methylation is more in, in the proteins, like the histones, like some scaffold proteins. But when you have methylation directly in the DNA, you have the methylation directly in the cytosine. So it can be reversible. OK, one I think I have one last question, if you mind. Uh, you said there's some changes in your DNA can be reversible, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah. And if you are now, if some person starts with a good diet and changes their habits and everything is going well in his life, how many times, how many, how long does it take that you can do, okay, you can watch the changes 
in your DNA? Do you know how much, how long? Okay, it depends on the gene, of course, because you have some molecular pathways that evolve in the expression of certain genes. So some of these molecular pathways that can change the expression of particular genes takes 72 hours. Yeah, so it is so fast. But there is another molecular pathways that depends on like physical activity and then change on one molecular pathway that change the metabolic things inside of the uh, uh, mm, brown adipose, adiposite. And then it uh, changed some metabolic uh, things in the muscles. So at the final, the epigenetic change on the muscle you you take uh, around six or 12 months to generate. So it's very different uh, thinking on the and on the molecular pathway. Some molecular pathways I short. Molecular pathway depends on different tissues and are very long. So the regulation can be years or can be hours. Like uh, <clears throat> overexpression of uh, GLUT4, the, this glucose transporter, it takes 72 hours when you all make a physical activity. You can increase the expression of GLUT4. Uh, this is a fast example. Mm -hmm. oh, really, that's really interesting. Um, so uh, I don't know if anyone has one more question. And... Um, if it's not, if anyone doesn't have one question, well, I would like to thank Dr. Daniel. Do you have a question? Sorry, someone opens the microphone and I didn't know. No, I think no. Uh, so, doctor, thank you so much, doctor, for being here. It was really an interesting topic and presentation because I think it's a different way to see the obesity. It's not only that you have putting on weight and you are getting fat and all that description that everybody does. If obesity has a lot of topics like immunology and this one is genetics, no? So, ah, sorry, it is one question, Danny, so sorry. Uh, okay. Sebastian, please, you can, do you want to open your microphone or do you yes. want to? Yeah, okay. Yes, there was this therapy that my classmate, that my classmate made for the, for the homework, the last project. And it was a leptin-based therapy, and and I wanted to know if there's a way that this therapy could work uh, treating the hunger. Okay, <clears throat> so leptin has a very strange uh, molecular pathway. Uh, it it is like design, design because uh, there is no design, <laughs> but. It's designed to work uh, as a reporter when when you have uh, when you don't have enough uh, fat reserves, uh, your storage of fat is less, so leptin goes down. So the brain detects that and makes more uh, storage of lipids. But but when you want to make that left uh, you want to make that leptin induced the weight loss, uh, it's almost impossible because you need say, that the leptin that is produced in the peripheral tissues goes through some transporters through the uh, um, peripheral barriers of the nervous systems, nervous system, um, the meninges. So when, when you have a lot, you can saturate these transporters and the result is the same. So if you applied a lead through IV, intravenous administration, uh, you, never you will never have a, res a good result. You need to make that the leptin goes through this barrier enter into the uh, 
into the nervous system, maybe through a uh, intrathecal administration or maybe like an infusion pump into the brain. But well, risk benefit, no? Uh, no one want to drill to hold in, in his head just to get, get a weight lost. So I have a, a, a class recorder uh, about obesity is very extent is two hours but if you want to know more about these uh, molecular pathways right now i can share the link to the class yeah uh, thank you. it's in spanish of course uh, everything is in my youtube channel but you can check it and also you know yeah, now that you are watching the chat, you can watch, uh, you can read, I don't know, the other question from Emmanuel. He wrote down the question, the, what happened if the person doesn't get, you know, he doesn't put any weight. The person that, who eats a lot, but they cannot put on some weight. Why is it so difficult for them? Is something about the genetics or what can be the explanation? <clears throat> well, uh, first of all, we can't uh, make like a di diagnosis uh, without see the person, without see the metabolisms, but we can take some ideas. One of them is the genetic char uh, the genetic makeup, personal genetic makeup. Uh, some people have uh, this polymorphism that makes uh, they process better the fat or better the proteins or something like this. But we also have the epigenetic adaptations. Some people have the contrary of this uh, thrifty phenotype. It's like this phenotype that they are like uh, burning, burning a lot because maybe his mother takes uh, or, or have an intake more than they need during the, his pregnancy. It is not so uh, studied like uh, 35. It's different because the processes are not clear and the molecular pathways are not clear. But these are my two ideas, this adaptation and the metabolism because the epigenetics or maybe a polymorphism that makes uh, they process more the biomolecules and they have less uh, anabolic uh, response uh, because uh, almost all of these people that can uh, gain weight can make this uh, uh, growing of the muscles. So, it's it's uh, it can be a genetic problem. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I don't know any more questions. Uh, yeah, I have a question from Epigenetic. Okay, Yolanda, thank you so uh, much. Doctor, can a promoter be demethylator? Well, uh, it depends of the process that make uh, methylated at the first time. If it if the promoter have these methylations outside of the cytokine cy cytosines, it can be de demethylated. Uh, of course, it is a regular process inside of our body. But when they are methylated inside of the cytosine, it can be demethylated. It depends on the uh, of the original process of methylation. As I told you, some uh, that are in the cytosines are inside of the uterus during the embryonic development and the others uh, makes during your uh, whole life. You right now can have some methylated promoter and your expression of this particular gene is low, but if you change the, these uh, environmental factors, 
maybe you make more exercise, you make less exercise, you eat something, you, uh, uh, you don't eat something, you can change this activation. As an example is the alcohol consumption. Uh, you can increase the alcohol, al alcohol decisions uh, when you take alcohol frequently. Uh, this is an example of, of that kind of methylation of promoters. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone has another questions? It can be in Spanglish, of course. It, uh, the idea is that you uh, practice your English, that you practice uh, and you lost the, the fear. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, uh, try, uh, you don't lose anything. And if you don't want, uh, well, there is my email and you know me, I'm in the Kutonala. So wherever you want, we can uh, take, a, take a, a, a break and talk a little bit about it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Annie. I think, yeah, I don't know if anyone has another Her, question. Yeah, I have another <laughs> one. Okay. Are there like, like any kind of, uh, of markers that can prove that there is like a genetic, um, how, how, how can I say it? like predisposition, like the, the person is predisposed to be obese or to be extra thin? Like, is there like an, a genetic marker about that? Oh, of course. You can check uh, your genetic makeup. <clears throat> you can check polymorphies, mutations, and some other things directly in your genome. Uh, right now, you can uh, contract a, a company that makes the entire uh, sequence of your genome, and they analyzed for this predis predisposition. Uh, right now is a reality. It's not cheap, but it's a reality. And there is another kind of diagnosis that you can make, like uh, with the real-time PCR, you can check methylation areas in some genes. And of course, you can check the predisposition so, to some diseases with this kind of, uh, of techniques. Great, and just another one, just the last one. Is there like a genetic predisposition to um, acquire neurodegenerative diseases? Oh, well, um, it depends of the, the, the disease because the, the regenerative diseases are a lot. Uh, Huntington, Alzheimer, um, Ella, so lateral sclerosis, lateral amyotrophic sclerosis. So uh, for each one, there is a couple of genes that you can check it. Uh, if you want to know about one in particular, please uh, send me an email and I can sh share some information with you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Anyone? Oh, okay. Thank you so much. I think uh, this webinar is really interesting, as I told you, because it gave us a different perspective of obesity. It, uh, to get or to have this disease, it has a lot of factors. And always we have the objective of clinical, you no? Know? But this time you have to watch obesity as a different situation and you can, you have to watch the immune system and the genetics and everything to have a good therapy for the patient. So thank you so much. Thank you everybody for being here. Uh, remember the next Wednesday is gonna be one of the last webinar and I hope you can join us. And especially thank you Dr. Daniel because he was a really interesting topic and was really well explained and Thank you so much for your time and make us feel comfortable for making any questions. So thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. And if you have anything more to say, well, I would like to say good night and 
have a great dinner. So thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.